Welcome to the Calvary Baltimore Weekly Sermon. Here's this week's teaching. We are in Luke chapter 19. So someone gave me a Father's Day present, which was so sweet. It's chocolate-covered bacon someone gave me. Oh, yeah. Today apparently will be a day of indulgence. Um, <laughs> if you find out I'm in a food coma, you know what did it. Mm -hmm. uh, also, some people that couldn't make it today. I was, um, was thinking of Kim uh, Reitmeyer, who's just struggling with uh, a lot personally at home. And Dave Powers, if you remember Dave Powers, he used to come for years. Uh, the walrus thick mustache, the nicest guy in the world. He's, he's laid up physically right now. There's just so many, so many needs. So I, I can't encourage you enough to just please, please pray for, for God's people. And if he's, you know, or desi you know, desires for them to walk through these difficult seasons, at least they can go through it with our prayers and God will honor those. So please, please, please pray. Uh, we are in Luke chapter 19. Um, we're going to pick up at verse 11. And as the story goes, Jesus is on his way to Jerusalem. Uh, he is one day away from Passion Week. So tomorrow he will have the triumphal entry. And first thing he does is he's walking through Jericho and everyone wants him to stay in Jericho, but Jesus isn't stopping. And all of a sudden there's a blind guy and the blind guy's going, son of David, have mercy. And Jesus calls the blind guy over to him. And he goes, what do you want me to do for you? <laughs> it seems almost a silly question, doesn't it? Uh, I'm blind and you're Jesus. Uh, put two and two together. <clears throat> but you have to remember, uh, there was uh, economic incentive to remain blind because people would give to the blind. If he said, Lord, take, heal my sight, he loses his income. And now he's a man who has no trade, no skills, now no more money coming in. Yeah. And Jesus goes, what do you want me to do for you? And he says, heal me. Uh, and then he follows the Lord. Then Jesus walks through Jer uh, Jericho. He's on his way up the Jericho road to Jerusalem. And he sees a wee little man. And a wee little man was he, way up high in a sycamore tree. And Zacchaeus, come down from there because I'm going to your house today. And... The salvation comes to Zacchaeus, and the whole town hates Jesus because Jesus loves Zacchaeus. And it's from that, from that story that Jesus then gives this parable. I have, I have shared, shared this passage before, but I was not your pastor then, and there are so many more things I want to share with you that I haven't before. So let's hop right on in. It is Luke 19, verse 11. And as they heard these things, he produced, uh, proceeded to tell them a parable. Because he was near to Jerusalem, and because they supposed that the kingdom of God was to appear immediately. So here is Jesus. He's from the line and lineage of David. He has a massive crowd following him. He's a powerful, dynamic speaker. He is of a military age. And he's on his way to Jerusalem where there are likely, according to works of antiquity such as Josephus, there are likely around two million devout Jewish people in Jerusalem right now. So Luke tells us that the people suppose that the kingdom of God was to appear immediately, which means here comes the son of David, great orator, military age. He's going to rally the Jewish people around him to start a revolt of some kind against the Romans. And because he's walking with the favor of the Lord, God's wrath will be poured upon Rome and a series of great military and political victories will ensue where those dirty, stinking, pork-eating Gentiles will be crushed. Sometime covered in, uh, in chocolate. And so Jesus gives this parable to help them think well about the kingdom. And the kingdom, the way God is bringing it. And what's really fascinating, you notice often Jesus gives parables and no one has any idea what he's talking about. Uh, but it's later, they, they think. And that's so often how the Bible works, isn't it? You read it, your devotion in the morning or at night and go, 
Yep, I got nothing. And then you'll come to it a year later, and all of a sudden it makes sense. Uh, well, here it, Jesus is going to help them frame the kingdom and the timing of the kingdom, and it doesn't seem that any of them are going to get it. But he's going to tell the parable anyways. Uh, verse 12. He said, therefore, a nobleman, this is a story, a nobleman went into a far country to receive for himself a kingdom and then return. So Jesus tells a story of a nobleman. And this nobleman is going to a far country. Going on a far country is another way of saying he's going on a long journey. And he's going on this long journey to receive the rights of a kingdom and then is going to return as the rightful king of said kingdom. Verse 13, calling 10 of his servants, 10 being a perfect amount, he gave them 10 minas. So each one he gave a mina. A mina was a hundred days wage. Uh, that's the amount of money he gives them, and they each receive one. So he gave them ten minas and said to them, engage in business until I come. So the nobleman leaves the country, puts the ten men in charge of raising money while he was away. Verse 14, now the plot thickens. But his citizens hated him and sent a delegation after him saying, we do not want this man to reign over us. So these citizens arrange a group of uh, 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 people to delegate to the far country to stop the coronation of the nobleman. And why? Because they hated the nobleman. They hated the master. Verse 15. <coughs> Excuse me. When he returned, <laughs> having received the kingdom, so their plan failed, he ordered these servants to whom he had given the money to be called to him, that he might know what they had gained by doing business. Really fascinating, something we miss in English, that if we read it in Greek, in Greek, that word for business there is a fancy word called a hapax legomenon. And it's a fancy way of saying it's the only time that word is used in the entire Bible. That word business there, and it has a very specific meaning. It means not show me the money, but show me how you made your money. Essentially, he is asking to see how these ten invested his money in a place that hated him. This is showing us that the master, though he cares about how much money the ten made, it seems that the master is more concerned with how they made their money. And the master's going to reveal in a moment that the mine of the hundred days wages was but a little to him. So the genius of the story is not that the master is looking for more money. It's that the master was looking for faithful, loyal servants. He's seeing how they made his money. The money is a test. A test to see who is willing to be publicly faithful to the master in a country that hated the master. The investment that the master is seeking to reap then is actually loyalty. Who is willing to represent the master in a country that hated him while he was away? And let me tell you something, just as a little, little footnote here. Money, money is nice. We all need money. Money's great. But there's always more money out there. But loyalty? That's the real treasure, the master definitely wants to find capable entrepreneurs, but what he really wants is faithful, loyal servants. And so the master returns and calls his ten servants together to see what they have done while he was away. Verse 16. The first came before him saying, Lord, your mina has made ten minas more. And he said to him, well done, good servant, because you have been faithful in a very little See, it's just but a drop in the bucket of his wallet. You shall have authority over ten cities. Now notice why the master is pleased. He doesn't say, you have made me more money, but rather, you have been faithful. Do you see that? The master is pleased because of the servant's faithfulness. And this servant didn't just make more money, he 10 x it. <laughs> he was given one mina and is now returning 11 minas. He was given 100 days worth of salary and is returning three years worth of salary. This faithful servant worked very hard for his master. So the first servant 
that proved himself faithful, he proved himself loyal to his master, even at risk of his own life, as the master is hated, and all who represent him and his business would also be hated. And so the master recognizes this and rewards him. Verse 18. And the second came saying, Lord, your mina has made five minas. Now, I think it's really insightful that Jesus doesn't, the master doesn't reprimand at all. He says, verse 19, and he said to him, and you are to be over five cities, um, which means he was also well done, good and faithful servant. The next servant didn't make ten minas more, but five. And this is still incredibly impressive. And so also certainly faced peril and hardship in the hostile country. Now, the story's been relatively warm so far. Everyone's doing good and making money. Now we're about to come to the hard bit. Verse 20. Then another came saying, Lord, here is your mina, which I kept laid away in a handkerchief. For I was afraid of you because you are a severe man. You take what you did not deposit and reap what you did not sow. Uh oh. <laughs> so here, our third servant is a man who believes the country hated the master, they malign the master, they speak ill of the master. And this servant agrees with the country. And so this man has hedged his bets. He neither sided with the enemies or sided with the master. He tried to stay neutral. Do you see that? He's seeking to please both sides, thus playing both sides of the ball. And we all know Christians like this, don't we? They have a faith, but they don't share it. They come to church when it's convenient. (laughs) If they're at work and people start saying bad things about the Bible, about God, about his word, they're silent. Their mina is buried. It's hidden. They're trying to live in a way that allows them to be saved when God returns, but are also living in a way that is not for God. There, there's, a, there's a term that we use uh, in America called fence-sitting. He's a fence-sitter. Or the Bible in the Old Testament, double-minded. In Jude, he's a cloud, but without water. We see often in the, uh, in the uh, when Jesus talks about being half-hearted. And notice, when the master returned, which I would suspect was a surprise to the wicked servant, he acted as if he was faithful. He says essentially that he was more afraid of the master than he was the people in enemy country, and so in his wisdom, he hid the money. But remember, the master did not give the money because he needed more money. The master gave the servants money to find loyal, faithful servants, which, of course, he's not. And then, like most cowards and manipulators, who does he blame? The master. I wasn't faithful because of you. I wasn't nice because of you. I wasn't whatever because of you. Not because of me, but you. The wicked servant didn't do what he was told because he said the master was so unreasonable. Now the master's going to speak. Awesome. Verse 22. And he said to to him, (laughs) he's going to respond very reasonably, might I add. I will condemn you with your own words. You wicked servant. You knew that I was a severe man. Now the master, isn't that interesting? He doesn't say, I'm not severe. He says, you knew I was severe. Now that's not the master necessarily saying that he is severe, uh, though he's not denying it either, but rather he's saying that the wicked servant believed him to be severe. You knew that I was a severe man, taking what I did not deposit and reaping what I did not sow. Why then did you not put the money in the bank? And at my coming, I might have collected it with interest. He's saying, he, Jesus goes to the bare minimum he could have done. You could have at least let someone else figure out how to make money with it. You could have put it in the bank and collected two or three percent interest, pal. You couldn't even do that. So the master is essentially saying, you contradict yourself. You say I'm harsh, yet your actions could only provoke my harshness. You say I'm full of wrath, yet you act in a way that can only bring about my wrath. 
And I find it fascinating that the master, again, says that putting money in the bank was an option. Like, that was a viable option, and yet the wicked servant didn't even attempt to do that. And I believe the reason the wicked servant didn't at least put money in the bank is because he didn't want to be associated with the master's money at all. This, I'd like to open an account. Oh, wow, well, you have 100 days wages. Wow, how'd you get that? The master, <laughs> he didn't want any of that. This wicked servant wanted to live in a land that hated the master without any connections to the master. He wanted to live as a resident of that country. And again, this is a man who's playing both sides of the fence. He wanted this, if the master ever came back, oh, I got your money. <laughs> But he got to live as if he was a citizen of that country. And he is trying to find love from the master and love from the world who hates the master. And, but one of the realities of this parable, and Jesus talks about this frequently, you can't do both. You cannot serve both God and mammon. You cannot serve both God and the world. You can't do it. For you will love one and will hate the other. Verse 24, And he, the master, said to those who stood by, Take the mina from him. And give it to the one who has ten minus. Now, verse 25 is so fascinating to me. And they said to him, who's they? I'm going to tell you. You don't have to answer. That's the crowd listening to the parable. Jesus is telling this story. And you know he's a good communicator. Because he's so, they're so locked in. When Jesus starts to tell it, they yell out, no! <laughs> they're so engaged in what's happening. Verse 25, and they said to him, Lord, he has ten minus. <laughs> Essentially, Lord, the rich man doesn't need any more money. And Jesus replies, verse 26, he's speaking to the crowd now. I tell you that to everyone who has, more will be given. But from the one who has not, even what he has will be taken away. But as for these enemies of mine, so Jesus is talking about where they're at, and he's talking about himself. But as for these enemies of mine who did not want me to reign over them, bring them here and slaughter them before me. Whew. There goes hippie Jesus, huh? <laughs> That's today's text. A uh, few thoughts here. One of my favorite stories in the Bible. There, everything in the gospel really is one of my favorite stories in the Bible, but I really love Luke 19. First, I'd like to explain what this parable is getting at. Uh, where Jesus tells this story, he's on his way to Jerusalem to die for the sin of the world. And why? Why? Because Jesus is in a country that hates the master so much, they're about to kill him. The country that hates the Lord is Jerusalem, is the world. And soon they're going to hate the master so much, they're going to kill him. And when Jesus, when he will die, he will then rise again and ascend into heaven. And he will send his Holy Spirit to his people and he will equip them in so many ways. With so many different resources. And one day, Jesus is going to return. And when he does, he's going to ask his people to give an account. Do you know you're going to have to stand before God one day? Yeah. And he's going to essentially say, show me how you did it. Show me how you lived. How did you invest with what I gave you? And you have to understand, God wants us to produce much. He wants us to be effective. But what he really seems to want is to see if we were faithful to him in a country that hates the master. And those who are faithful will be received by God and placed on thrones to serve alongside of him. And those who remain undedicated to the master will come under judgment and will be slaughtered at his feet. Secondly, there's a historical event that looms in the background of this parable. And for those of you that have been here for any amount of time, you know I love history. Uh, and there is definitely history in the back of this. So Jesus, again, is one day away from Passion Week. This is somewhere around 30 AD, and Israel is presently under Roman occupation. And as many of you know, the Jewish people hated the Romans. Uh, and this is why people hated tax collectors like Zacchaeus. Because who'd Zacchaeus collect taxes for? 
the Romans. That money helped fund the foreign occupation of Israel. So Zacchaeus was like one of those Gentiles. And so they hated Zacchaeus. Now, Rome was not very fond in return to the Jewish people. Because the Jewish people were always causing problems. They, they could riot like no one's business. They would, have, they would start uh, wars. The, 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 the Jewish people, in a lot of ways, were headaches for the Romans, as they often revolted and mobbed. They had very strange laws to the Romans. They couldn't understand how someone could have only one God that was just strange to them. And so Rome, in order to manage this region better, they gave oversight of this land to a brutal man named Herod the Great. Herod was a horrible wicked man. And he understood he was never going to win the favor of the people. And so he led Israel with brutality. This is what's behind the story of Jesus's birth. Remember, he goes to the wise man. He says, oh, tell me where the king is that I may worship him. And he really wants to kill baby Jesus. And the wise men are tipped off. So they run away. And then he, if Herod gets so mad, it's he's angry, angry. It's like he tears his palace apart. And then he kills all the children in Bethlehem under a certain age. He's a brutal, vicious man. Well, in 4 BC, Herod the Great died. And you'd think, oh, thank God the evil guy, Hitler's dead. Come to find out his sons were Hitler 2.0. And Israel was split up into three sections, and his sons were crazy. Uh, and his agreement with Rome was, is that his sons would take the throne the, uh, in Israel in three sections after his death. And again, unfortunately, Herod the Great's sons were also named Herod and were also horrible. The worst one, of course, was Herod Archelaus, who was in placed in charge of where? You guessed it, Jerusalem. Southern Israel, parts of Judea. And in fact, not long after his father's death, Herod Archelaus, in response to the Jewish people also hating him, he decided to send a bunch of Romans into the temple, 4 BC, on Passover, and killed 3,000 Jews. It was so violent, it was so awful, Jerusalem was all but emptied. People just canceled like Christmas. It's canceled. They canceled Passover and left. So you can imagine the Jewish people hated, loathed Archelaus. Well, the Jewish people so distraught that this was the beginning of his reign, meaning it's going to get worse. The Jewish people sent messengers to Rome and begged them to not allow Archelaus control over the region. And even though Archelaus' father, Herod the Great, had an agreement with Rome that Archelaus would be king after his death, Rome heard how vicious and evil this man was and came up with a compromise. Archelaus was allowed to rule southern Israel and Jerusalem, but he was not allowed to be given the title of king. And the thought behind Rome was, if this guy can just play nice for a while, if we can incentivize it, then we'll give him the title of king, because that's what every egomaniac wants, a title. And so he, they try to incentivize his kindness. But as the story goes, he was never nice to the Jewish people and never got the title king. But Rome was trying to get him to play ball. Well... Also, as the story goes, whenever a regional king like Herod the Great dies, his successor must go to Rome and receive permission to assume the regional throne and swear allegiance to Rome. And despite the Jewish people's best attempt, Archelaus still came back as their ruler. And so as we heard from today's story, it seems very likely that the Jewish people would have heard Jesus' parable, and who would they have thought of from this nobleman, from this master? This is the story of Archelaus. Now Jesus reveals that he's the master from the story. Jesus is revealing that the people of Jerusalem, the people of Israel, look at him as Archelaus. They look at him as a cruel, evil, and nasty master. And here, the, the chief priests and the Pharisees and the Sadducees, before the Father and before the people, they object to his rule. 
But unlike the story of Archelaus before Caesar, the father will not accept the Jewish people's request. And unlike Archelaus, Jesus is going to be crowned king when he steps into heaven. And he will return as their king with title. And he will rule them forever and ever. So Jesus is revealing, you may have had some success with Archelaus whom you hated. You stand no chance here. You're going to stand, be, but you're going to be dragged before my feet as I am crowned King of King and Lord of Lords. You will not stop what is coming, which I find absolutely fascinating. Thirdly, I love what the faithful servant says. This is really good. He says, Lord, your mina has made ten more minas. Isn't that a great way to think about it? Yeah. The first two faithful servants really emphasize your minas. Again, Jesus is the master who left this earth to a faraway country and received all authority from the Father and who will come back as king. And his people must give an account for what they did while he was away. And when that day comes and God asks you what you did with the things he gave you, have you ever thought, how will I respond? When God says, why should I allow you into heaven? Have you thought about that? Have you thought if he says, what fruit did you produce in your life? How will you respond that day? Because you're going to have to give an answer. And here's the reality, loved ones. All of the money that you have, all of the health that you have, all of the charm and humor that you possess, any redeeming quality in you, all of it. All of it, all of it, all of it comes from God. There is, not, you, there is not one good thing in your life that does not come down from the Father of lights. That does not come from the Lord. Do you know why you woke up and your, your, your lungs functioned this morning? Because God is... He's pumping those lungs. You know why your brain is communicating with your hands today? Because God is firing those neurons. And here in today's story, the most faithful of the ten, he says so perfectly, Lord, your mina has made more minas. This is one of the assertions of the book of, uh, of Solomon from the book of Ecclesiastes, that it's all God's resources anyways. A faithful believer who has been given their mind as the re, you've been given these resources, your gifts, your health, your abilities. If God would bring fruit about from your life or, or, or my life, it will not only be because God's resources have made more resources. As Paul would say, it's not I, but Christ who lives in me. God is bringing about the production. God's not only bringing about the harvest, he made the seed that produces the harvest. You know, I was, I, was, I was at a pool last week, and I was sitting there, and I was talking to a guy. He was covered head to toe in tattoos and had on an ankle bracelet. And, uh, he was on house arrest, uh, though they let him out. And we, we were talking. He was a really nice guy, and I think talking to me was a hoot to him because I was just a, a very different sort of person. And um, you know, he came from West Baltimore, and I could just tell it was like, uh, it was culture shock. You know, what, what, what he just got done spending five years in prison, he just got out, and here he was beside a pool, and me and him were chit chit chatting and having a great old time. Um, and, and, and we, but we were, we were chatting, and, and, and we were talking, and I, Honest to God, I, it, it, was, it was such a reminder to me, because for those of you that don't know, I used to work at a, at a rehab in Baltimore, and I would talk to some of these men, and they started drugs at nine years old. Yeah. At 10, 11 on heroin. Given guns and weed as a babysitter, as a little children. And, you know, I'm talking to this person, and it was like, you know, me, me and him were both in agreement. It's like, what chance were you given? Yeah. You know, it's like if, I, if, I, if any one of us was placed into that position, would we be any better? Of course not. You know, and I share this because I was born into a family with two loving parents that loved me very much. And you know what? That love produced more minus. 
That's a gift from God. And I was taught the word of God at a young age. Do you know how rare that is? That's the Lord's minus that produces. And I believed it. You think I believed it and someone didn't because I'm better? That's the Lord's minus. He gave me faith. You know, God deserves the glory for any successful investments that you have made. For any good in your life, for all the increase, because ultimately all of it has come from him. Because we're all investing with his mind as anyways. And this is something that the faithful servants must understand. This is something that the reformers understood. When they stepped away from what was the Roman Catholic Church and and all of the rules and regulations and stipulations and councils and creeds, they understood the, the, the plain, simple, soli dio gloria, that all glory belongs to God alone. God does not need to share his glory with any pope, with any vicar, with any council. If there's anything good in our lives, it's because God has been so kind to us. And out of that kindness, he has produced a bounty. And so God deserves the glory. And that's exactly what these faithful servants get at. God, look at what you have done. Do you know how hard they must have worked to 10x that money when all those people hated them? And you know, you know how hard that was? I think about how hard it is to be a Christian. <laughs> Sometimes it's really difficult. Yeah. And I don't know if you've ever been in business situations where people are just shady. And they're, they're cutting corners and they're not doing this and they're not being ethical. And there you are. It's like, do I do what everyone else is doing or am I honest? Well, you better be honest because God's going to see how you made your money. It's very hard to represent a master in a country that hates him. And God's faithful people need to go to him and say, Lord, look what you have produced as you have scars on your back from producing it. Because ultimately, all the good in your life comes from him. Now, fourth and finally, why did Jesus tell this parable in the first place? Well, because the Jewish people supposed that the kingdom of God was to appear immediately. They were ready, weren't they? They were ready for Jesus to destroy Rome. I mean, there were, there were something around maybe 5,000 Roman soldiers in Jerusalem at this time. There's over 2 million Jews. They, they could have taken the city. They were ready. And in fact, part of it, remember when the high priest came to arrest Jesus in the garden and Peter hacked off the ear of, of, of Malchus? And, and, and Peter's essentially like, all right, Lord, go get him now. Like, even the disciples were like, let's get this going, God. Let's get those Romans, hit them with your lightning bolt, you know. And Jesus puts the ear back on Pete. Pete, you don't get it, buddy. (laughs) Jesus tells this story essentially saying that the master, he needs to leave. He needs to leave the country that hates him, and he will go on a learning journey, but he will come back. But it will be a while. Jesus is revealing that the millennial kingdom is not at hand, but will come after his being murdered within the week and after his journey to the Father and after his heavenly coronation. And so the reason Jesus gave this parable was to teach us that we must wait for his return and how we must wait for his return. Here's the reality, loved ones. There is coming a day when Jesus is coming back to earth. (laughs) And when Jesus returns... He is not coming back to a world that will love him. He's coming back to a world that hates the master. And he is coming back to a world that have a lot of quote unquote servants in it. Who live as if they hate the master. And Jesus is going to look at his servants and examine how they behaved while he was away. I want you to notice, at least in this parable, that Jesus' concern is about how his servants conducted themselves during his absence. One of the reasons I wanted to share this story today, not only because we're heading into the millennial kingdom in Revelation, but 
This story serves as such a reminder. A reminder of what Jesus is looking for in your life. You ever say, Lord, what do you want me to do? God, how do you want me to behave? How do you want me to live? How do you want... Lord. (laughs) And this story is telling you exactly what he's looking for. He has given every single one of us minus. He's given every single one of us measures of faith and spiritual gifts and resources and families and whatever. But what I love about this is Jesus does not give us these things because he expects us to 10x his investments or else. (laughs) What I love about this story is that Jesus shows us that he's not necessarily looking for bounty, but faithfulness. Isn't this exactly how the book of Job begins? God looks upon the whole earth. And who does he brag about? Job. God took such delight in the faithfulness of Job. God is looking down from heaven right now. He's watching you right now from heaven. And what he wants from your life is simple, everyday, faithful obedience to his word. And when Jesus returns, the same exact thing will be true. He is looking for faithful servants who are obedient to his word. Jesus says in Matthew 24, uh, 45, Who then is the faithful and wise servant, whom his master has set over his household, to give them their food at the proper time? Blessed is that servant whom his master will find so doing when he comes. Do you see that? Jesus says in Luke, uh, Luke 12, 35, stay dressed for action and keep your lamps burning and be like men who are waiting for their master to come home from the wedding feast so that they may open the door to him at once when he comes and knocks. These are people ready for his return. Blessed are those servants whom the master finds awake when he comes. Truly I say to you, he will dress himself for service and have them recline at his table and he will come and serve them. If he comes in the second watch or in the third watch, notice there's a delay that's happening, um, and finds them awake, blessed are those servants. Later Jesus says, Peter said, Lord, are you telling this parable for us or for all? And the Lord said, Whom then is the faithful and wise manager, whom his master will set over his household to give them their portion of food at the proper time? There's a correlation between these two parables. Who is the faithful servant? Jesus says, Blessed is that servant whom his master will find so doing when he comes. Truly I say to you, he will set him over all his possessions. Over and over and over again. Jesus instructs us that he will be gone for a long time. You say, Jesus hasn't returned back in 2,000 years? Yeah, he told us it'd be a long time. This return is going to take a long time. But that does not mean that his people, his servants, can neglect their duties. In fact, that's part of the point of the delay. Will my people serve me while I am gone? Jesus, over and over and over again, he expects his people to be faithfully serving during his delay. And in today's story, when Jesus gave the minus, he wanted to see faithfulness and loyalty more than he wanted to see a massive return. You know, the Bible tells us that God owns the cattle on a thousand hills. (laughs) Please understand something. You own absolutely nothing that God needs. There is nothing that you can give God that he doesn't already have. He's given you a mina. He owns a thousand cities. (laughs) There's nothing you have that he needs. And in fact, the second God needs anything from you, he ceases to be God. Because a truly omniscient one doesn't need anything from anyone. What God wants from you is your heart. He wants your loyalty. He wants your faithfulness. Will you do what he's asked of you in his word? Now you say, what what has he asked from me in my word? You should be reading your Bible and know that answer. Have you put your sins as far away from you as possible? You want to know what God's will for your life is? Stop sinning. Well, what's my sin? I don't know what it is. Yes, you do. 
If you've had the same question for 10 years about something, you probably shouldn't do it anymore. (laughs) We're to support the body of Christ. Do you know that? Some people come to church because they only want to be filled, not because they want to fill others. Hate to break it to you, that's sin. You are part of a body to be part of a body. A part of the body that only serves itself has severed itself from its body. It's a liver that's dead. It's not feeding everything else. And you know you're to love his people. And that includes those beyond these four walls. And you know you're supposed to fish for men. You know, I'm not trying to guilt trip anybody, but when's the last time you shared the gospel with anybody outside of this building? That is your duty as his servants. And that doesn't mean you need to walk around, Jesus loves you, let's talk about a t-shirt. And, you, know, uh, 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 you know, but if doors aren't opening for you to share the gospel, I think the bigger question is why aren't doors opening for you to share the gospel? And there's so many people that want to be used, but then you know, it seems like they're not being used. And the question is, are you putting yourself in positions to be used? Are you trying to produce more minus? Or are they buried? And hope someone asks about them. You know, there's a very big difference there. You know, when we stand before God on Judgment Day, this is what God wants to see. Did you act? Did we act like cowards and hide our minas and our gifts and our light, or did we publicly invested for His kingdom? Where, where, where are we willing? Are, are we willing to be hated and scorned? And, and, and as we represent our Master. Really, if I could summarize this, are you willing to be bold in enemy territory? You know, I want you to notice, too, that the one who gave ten back, and the one who gave five back, and the one who would have given three percent back, every single one of those would have been rewarded. Did you notice that? You know, sometimes we can think, oh, if I only produced this much, if I, that's not what God's looking for. He's looking for even just the tiniest little bit of fruit. (laughs) But he's looking for fruit. There needs to be some investment towards his kingdom. The story is such a reminder, again, to not hyper-worry about results as every single one of these faithful people were rewarded and invited into his kingdom. But... Again, it's not to hyper-worry about results or about how much fruit is in our lives, but to just invest what God has given you and and, and placed in you and to be faithful. And and again, don't misunderstand what I'm saying. I'm not saying you don't need to produce anything. Of course not. Faith without good works is shipwrecked. It's dead. There needs to be good fruit in your lives. But what I'm saying is if your emphasis is on faithfulness, the works will come. I can't emphasize that enough. If you're focused on just being faithful to the word of God, the works will come. God will blow apart your schedule and open up so many conversations. If your emphasis is on faithfulness, the works will come. But if your emphasis is on the works, you are at great risk and peril of succumbing to pride. We must serve the master because we know and love the master. It's so important, you know, right now we see with the LGBTQ plus movement, it's so much, you know, you see the slogan, love wins, um, which means that hate loses. And and, and the, the messaging is biblical Christianity is now considered hate speech in large parts of the country. And what are they saying? That what God has said in his word is hateful. They're maligning the God of the Bible. They're maligning the master. We cannot believe, we cannot believe what the world says about our Lord. We can't buy it. We must serve him because we know him. We know that he is lovely. We know that he is good. We know that he is kind. And so we serve him because we love him, because we don't believe what the country that hates him says about him. We know it's not true. And again, what a reminder for us to just be faithful, to work hard and honestly and serve others. And to not go get get so caught up in results, but to focus on our love and loyalty for the master. And, you know, I I point out Matthew chapter 7 a lot, but think about Matthew chapter 7. Remember the story where they go before the Lord and they say, Lord, Lord, 
Didn't we produce many mighty miracles in your name? Didn't we cast out demons in your name? Didn't we do many great things in your name? And God doesn't say that they're wrong. They, they did cast out demons. They did produce many miracles. And what does God say to them? Away from me, I never knew you, you workers of lawlessness. In Matthew chapter 7, all these men are going to stand before God on judgment day and say, God, look at all the minas I made for you. Look at all of this stuff I made for you. And on that day, God's going to say, away from me, I never knew you. Because it's not necessarily about how much you make, it's how you made it. How do you produce the fruit? Because do you know there's a way to produce for the kingdom of God that's really ultimately about you? How many mega churches are filled with, uh, their pulpits are filled with egomaniacs who are sleeping with the congregants and making $20 million and they need that third jet? Uh, It's crazy. God's not going to look at them and go, wow, you really, I'm going to put you in charge of a million cities. You did so good. No, he can't trust them. They weren't building his kingdom for God, they were building their kingdom for them. God wants obedience more than sacrifice. Faithfulness, faithfulness, faithfulness is what he is looking for. As I was preparing this study all this week, that's all I kept thinking of. God's people need to be faithful. This isn't, this isn't an attractive message. This isn't, but it's what we need to know. Amen? Let's pray. God, we love you, we, we praise you, we thank you. We ask that you again, you be with us today, that you bless us today. We ask that you be with your people today. We, we pray for those who that long to be here, that desire to be here, that you may strengthen them and encourage them. Um, and God, if, if possible, God, strengthen their bodies that they may come again. God, we thank you for your word and all the words that are contained within it. God, we pray that you help us to be faithful. Help us to, to, to not hide what you have given us, God, but let us be cities on a hill. Let us shine brightly, Lord, for your glory. And God, we do pray for production. We do pray that you produce in our lives, God, but help us to produce the right way, God. Let, us, let it be for your glory, not for ours. Help us to be faithful, Lord. We, we do pray. And God, we pray for anyone here that needs special prayer that they may go and get it by our prayer team off to the side. And if anyone's wounded or, or struggling here today, don't let them leave without talking with someone. God, please not, help us to not only come Sundays and be filled, but help us to fill and bless others. We do pray. And send us out, God, with a passion for souls and a desire for obedience. And in Jesus' name, all of God's people said... Amen. Let's stand and worship. That's today's message from Calvary Baltimore. Thanks for joining us. If you'd like to know more about us, visit calvarychapelbaltimore.org. Our email address is calvarybaltimore1 at gmail.com. To financially support the work God is doing through Calvary Baltimore, go to calvarychapelbaltimore.org and click Give. And if you're in the area, stop by on a Sunday morning. For directions and service times, go to our website at calvarychapelbaltimore.org. Live streams and weekly sermons are available on our website, our Facebook page, and YouTube. You can also watch with our mobile app and on Apple TV and Roku. Search for Calvary Chapel Baltimore on these platforms for instant access to great Bible teaching and encouragement. We hope you've been blessed by this week's teaching. Until next time, as Pastor Josh says, study the Word, to live the Word, to share the Word. And join us again for the next Calvary Baltimore Weekly Sermon.